Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. Hope you're having a great season so far. What? What do you mean you haven't started yet? Jeez, get out there. Your dog is going crazy without getting the exercise he deserves. Maybe we can help you today. My good friend Tom Jenkins will be joining me. You heard him before on the podcast. Tom and I have, uh, <clears throat> well, hunted together quite a bit in the last few seasons, and we're going to recap our opening weekend alone and together, separate but equal, same zip code, but uh, different spots. Looking forward to the shared camaraderie from that trip. It should be a lot of fun. Maybe you can relive some of your own or or you can have some of ours vicariously. We hunted wild chuckers and wild valley quail in southeast Oregon, but that story will be coming in just a few minutes. In the meanwhile, we'll also be covering later in the podcast your first photos of the new season. We talked a little bit about well, how it went on your own opening weekend last week. This time, we're going to talk all about the visuals, uh, see what I can do there. It might be a little bit of a challenge, but there's so many great pictures to talk about from our social media. So that'll be coming up as well. Right now, though, uh, we are recuperating. We are, um, well, Flick is. Well, so am I, actually. Got to got some more help on my football, baseball knee. And uh, hopefully that's going to take because we got a big trip planned very soon. But more importantly, Flick, in one of the few places I'd never even thought about being as careful, tore a pad. Take your right pinky finger. If you grew your nail out another half inch, three quarters of an inch, you know the little tip of the finger right there? That's where the pad is torn. Goodly chunk of it. We're rehabbing it right now. It seems to be working. You know, the the, the more I do, the more I'm impressed with um, with his resilience. Uh, he's, he's also a very good patient, by the way, putting up with all the wrapping and the antiseptic and all the things that go with that. But it is working, and let's hope it recovers soon enough. We've got uh, probably 300 miles of hunting to do in the next three weeks, four weeks. So... Give him your best thoughts, and uh, we'll talk more as we get closer to that trip. We are made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, True Lock Choke Tubes, and Fur Feathers Friends.com. Yeah, you don't need to go with us to Huron to be in on that. It's kind of a grassroots thing, so learn more at Fur feathersfriends.com Well, I haven't talked much about rough grouse nor the eastern part of the United States for a while. Just got another writing assignment for a magazine that uh, serves that area. So I thought I'd hit some of the high points for rough grouse hunters. It's that time of year for you. The leaves are starting to drop or at least change color, change color and that's good too. So uh, if you're headed out and you're looking for some place to start or you're looking for a new place, here are for a few suggestions state by state. In New York, take a look at the Rattlesnake Hill Wildlife Management Area or the Irwin Wildlife Management Area. Irwin with an E. In Maine, That golden road on the north end of the state is always worth a look. Check out the public access, the paper company land up there in the National Forest, of course. In the New Hampshire area, the White Mountains, hands down, one of the best. Vermont, West Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Classic state, Pennsylvania, head to state game lands number 104 or Raytown, Raystown Lake. In Connecticut, it's the Collar Wildlife Management Area. Collar with a K, K O L L A R. And those rehabbed coal fields in Mingo and Pocahontas counties in West Virginia are always worth a little bit of your time and your dog's effort. If you're heading out for rough grouse, be safe. Tell us how you do. And we are brought to you by Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. And this week, their pro shop, just got to tell them, thanks again, everybody, for having the stuff I need when I need it. Their pro shop online at midvalleyclays.com has just about anything you need to round out your gear selection for this season. Uh, 
high-end shooting glasses from Beretta, RE, Ranger, and Edge. Hearing protection of all sorts, Negrini cases, range bags, gun cleaning supplies, apparel, Benchmade knives, and even some choke tube selections. It's all at midvalleyclays.com. And yes, uh, another couple weeks, and I'll see you in Huron, South Dakota. If you'd like to go with me, go to furfeathersfriends.com. But if you'd like to go on your own or with some buddies, whether it's for the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge in November, or just to take advantage of the 124,000 acres of public access that's all within one hour's drive of downtown, go to Hunt Huron SD. Dot com. They'll send you a free information packet, including the state's hunting atlas, some coupons, some information. You'll get everything you need to make your visit to Huron, South Dakota, productive and fun. And if you are joining us for Fur Feathers Friends, all the better. I'll see you there. And I'll see you at HuntHuronSD.com. Yeah, so welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. My good friend Tom Jenkins has joined me. We had an interesting opening weekend in Southeast Oregon uh, for a lot of reasons, and I'll kind of give you a little background for for both of our sake. Uh, Originally, we last year at the end of the season had decided we'd open the season in Northwest Nevada place we both like and and a good friend of mine from music school comes up and uh, so we were all set on that we had the date we had all sorts of arrangements made including Tom's son Christian was going to come there and then in the middle of uh, two weeks ago or thereabouts I get an email from the Nevada Department of Wildlife telling me uh, that there's a youth chucker hunt that weekend and basically saying no big boys allowed so I'm uh, I'm scrambling, thinking, well, wait a minute, how did I miss that memo the first time around? I still haven't dug into that. It's it's academic, but so all of a sudden we're scrambling to find somewhere else, and we go back to our old standby in Knockwood. They had room for us in the little RV park. We came down, we camped there, we hit some of the spots we know and love, and some new spots too. And luckily, everybody who was supposed to be there got there okay. So Tom. Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Hey, thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's good to talk on on mic about stuff we didn't talk about. And and you know that I got to number one. Thanks for bringing that fire pit. It made the trip. It really <laughs> did. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, it was my <laughs> wife's idea. Oh, unfortunately, really? <laughs> but uh, she wanted one for the backyard. So I'm like, well, two birds with one stone. Well, it worked out great, and and we'll talk about that too. Um, we're down in Southeast Oregon, place we know, um, high desert, lots of hills, lots of snakes. We didn't see any. Nobody saw any snakes the whole time, did uh, we? No, I killed a rattlesnake. Oh, that's right. You did. Yeah. Um, thank you, I think. And I stepped on one yesterday oh, no in kidding. another hunt. Oh, my That God. wasn't a rattler, though. Oh, good. But I actually stepped on the snake. Because that's usually um, Sunday of opening weekend down there in that place we you and me both call Chucker Mountain. Yes. The annual tradition is me stepping on one. Yes. Knock wood. Didn't do it. So we're down there, and um, we got more stuff than we know what to do with, and you bring that fire pit out. And it's a little RV park. It's got four or five spaces, and we're lucky enough to get the last space. And everybody there was nice. And yes. some were hunters. In fact, one was a member of my dog club from way back who had just happened to be there and other people just passing through from Alaska and other places. But that fire, that fire was like a magnet for nice people. <laughs> There's something about staring into a fire yeah. that just breaks all the barriers. Mm-hmm. Not with a little beer and whiskey mm-hmm. and everybody wants to come hang out around the fire. Yeah, it works for all sorts of reasons. Yes. And so I'm I'm going to I'm going to find a collapsible version of that because I, I think I need to leave that in the truck. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So so the next morning we're up uh, at the crack of not dawn. You guys were up at the crack of dawn. Your son Christian and you got an earlier start than me and Dave. Um, but this is country we know well. And so let's just kind of talk about where you went and what you saw because you went to places we didn't go to and we went to places you didn't go to so you start <laughs> well my my son christian is obviously uh uh he's in his early 30s so he's a little more exuberant yeah that's 60, one way to put it yeah that's like 60 year olds are um, <laughs> but uh i asked him what time he wanted to get up and he's like we need to be out there early, and that's the other thing that we experienced this uh, yeah. opening right now here in Oregon. We're having an Indian summer, and we're in the upper 70s to 80s for highs, and our wire here, hairs don't, uh, don't work so well at those temperatures. So by about 10, 1030, it's, uh, they're, they're just smoked with the heat, and a lot of the time we're doing 15 minutes of hunting and five ten minutes of letting them cool down in the shade and drink water so um really had to watch the dogs in the heat because yeah. they're working so hard in this terrain um, that was definitely a limiting factor on the hunt which just meant i got to spend more time in <laughs> camp through the middle of the day and uh you know but uh, then we were back out in the evening when it started to cool down so yeah. you know it's not like the the winter where we pretty much are out all day up on state and keeping the elevation yeah all yeah. day long instead of having to give it up by 10 o'clock yeah i'm thinking about the last hunt dave and i did in a place that you've i think you've been to and you you went high on the other side the last time we talked about that place but um it was a big mistake for a bunch of reasons but we kept hearing chuckers up there so we we did it we, <laughs> we said no let's do it after lunch we were there what the heck we'll see how the dogs do we'll see how we do we got up there and we, we did find birds, but it was a grueling climb. Yes. Because it was probably 75 degrees. But we were in a place where we knew there was water at the bottom. And and you guys went to some of the same places we both know that have water most of the time, reliable water. The thing that was amazing to me was how few places did. Yeah, this, uh, in, in the Northwest, we are... You know, like everywhere here is droughting, but we've definitely had, we had a very wet spring mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and kind of an early wet summer, but in the middle latter summer, we have had not any rain. Yeah. So it's probably the driest I've seen for an opener. Places that typically had some seeps and water were dry. Um, and I think that concentrated the birds even more over the water. So we had big coveys. Uh, but the interesting thing this year, because we had a wet spring, um, and it, I saw this with a quail, and then it turned out to be the same with chucker, is we had some very late hatches, and we had some we had killed some chuckers who were just getting their color, yeah, um, yeah. the size of a, a hun, even mm -hmm. smaller. Um, so that was kind of different than we've seen before. But uh, there was there's a good crop of birds this year. Yeah, it was we got lucky on that. The timing is everything on rain and hail and that sort of thing, and we did get lucky on that, and it did pay off. The other thing it paid off in is that last climb that we did on Sunday afternoon. At the very top, I either forgot it, it's been ten years since I've been up there, forgot or never knew, or maybe it's new this season. There was a swale of cheatgrass um, that was so thick and so big it's no wonder there was a covey of chuckers up there you know we we joke about it and it's sometimes it's not true in fact when i cleaned those birds um none of them had cheatgrass seeds in their crop they had something else and i think it was um the seeds in the middle of a rose hip those little round light colored seeds yeah we found both we found yeah. we found okay. some that were just stuffed full of uh, uh -huh of cheatgrass and some that had and i was kind of surprised though there wasn't more grasshoppers in their crawls yeah um, yeah but there wasn't as many grasshoppers this no. year as i think we've seen in the past years for some reason well uh, somebody made me aware of that whole phenomenon recently and um i'd never thought they were a, a real food source for chuckers let alone quail 
you know, in a you know you know mano a mano battle, a coil might lose to a grasshopper, but uh, I I didn't see many either, and uh, and the quail, virtually all the quail that I cleaned, had nothing in their crops. Oh, that's interesting. Go figure. Yeah. yeah. Um. But we did find a bunch, like you said. And uh, let, let's start on, on Saturday. We we split up. You know, we got together to go hunting on opening weekend, then we didn't hunt together. But here we get to de- well, debrief on it. <laughs> there, there was a good reason that we did not hunt together. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell them the story uh, of the... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, two male dogs didn't yeah. get along. And, yeah. Uh, and rather than test that theory any further yes um we we just decided that was good and you had christian with you and i thought it was a good time for you guys to hunt yeah some new ground because he'd never seen some of that ground had he no i take i took him on some new hunts um but opening morning we didn't we didn't jump a covey yeah Yeah. which is like on opening day on this first hunt, a place that i've hunted many times we did not jump a covey of chucker even though the dogs were birdie. That was another yeah. problem. It was so dry that the uh, ground scent was just terrible. It was. Trying to uh, ground track any birds where they went. So it was pretty much, we just had to bump into them, yep. to get air scent for them to even come on point just because they could not track a bird, you know, yeah. track it, them down. It was pretty tough. We, the, we, we hunted that one. We hunted a new creek that I'd never gotten through on gate number five, you know, that ranch. Um, it's a uh, it's a walk-in area, but you need the combination to the gate from the owner and that sort of thing. We finally got up in there. And, and of course, you know, you can't see it from the highway, so you drive all the way up that wicked road. And as you get over the last rise and turn down, there's two trucks. So Dave scouted a spot, and he said, well, you can cross a creek right here, and Dave's always like that. Yeah. Well, why do you have four-wheel drive, you know? So we did, and no, no serious damage done to the truck. We got to the other side and hunted that side, and the first thing we hear is shots coming from the other side. But they're not very close, and there's a lot of them. So there's a dilemma for you. Hey, there, there appear to be a lot of birds on this side, so now what? Well, we, we kind of did an about face and started working back towards the creek and downhill from there, so we were away from them. And sure enough, the first birds we found on the water were chuckers. We got a pair up. I whacked one. It fell on the other side. And these creeks are the only riparian, they're the only lush green habitat there. So when you drop a bird in that stuff, you better have a good dog because you'll never find you can't even get in it yeah so we just sat back we kind of marked it right i kind of sent flick for the right spot and sure enough in five or eight minutes here he comes with that bird which pushed off another bunch and so we each got a, a low bird shot uh, on the flats away going away from the creek and that was one of the birds that dave shot that was very young second or third hatch yeah. i thought it was a hen quail when flick brought it back to me yeah they're small yeah yeah um so so that was fun for all those reasons and then uh and then uh the quail started showing up and i don't know if they were all pushed from those other hunters or not but we were grateful for them believe <laughs> me because we had single hunting on not only was it singles that actually behaved pretty good the walk was downhill yes <laughs> that's even better yeah um so you saw nothing that first morning we got skunked opening wow. morning wow which is like never happened yeah yeah so uh so we in the afternoon went to chucker mountain um which i knew there would be birds there but we call it chucker mountain for a reason because it's 45 degrees full of rocks full of brush and just na- the nastiest scree walking but that's why there's birds there yeah and so we we did a hunt up there and uh about blew my right knee out again coming back down yeah I can't, it's always on the downhill uh, but i hit two coveys just struggling to get back down and uh the first one when i tried to swing up to shoot i slipped right 
fell right on my butt. <laughs> and I shot and killed one chucker sitting on my butt as they were flying away. So I thought that was a, a pretty good shot. No, absolutely. <laughs> and this is how it happens out there, everybody. You know, you are falling half the time when you're taking shots. Last year when Tom and I were hunting together, that place with the money name, um, I was I, – I, that's why I had to have injections on my knees, I think, this year because <laughs> I landed on both of them as I shot that bird. And it uh, worked. But, but that's what it's all about. And the second covey, I was using my Benelli – as a walking stick <laughs> up trying to get downhill with a, a knee that I'm getting a knife in the side of it. Oh. So, and another covey gets up and somehow the walking stick turned into a shotgun again. And I, I dumped one of those. Um, so, and I'm just stumbling down the mountain and yeah. running into birds, yeah. but, uh, that's kind of what happened is we had a big covey and they just got all spread out. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I think we came out of there with eight or nine, birds that yeah. afternoon yeah, so we kind of real good by the end we kind of redeemed the yeah. morning yeah on that we both shot a couple sets of doubles on that wow that thing um nice. anyway so we were feeling a little bit better about opening day <laughs> after that but mornings were a struggle so yeah ironically because you'd think the sending conditions would be better and and the dogs would would be more energetic um just a reminder you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden that's my hunting buddy tom jenkins we've already yes we've already planned our next assault on another chucker spot so don't worry yeah we're in the mood and we're getting primed for that one now too and in the meanwhile, I'll see you in South Dakota. So if you're going to the Fur Feathers Friends event, uh, don't forget to let me know you're going to be there at at least one or the other of those things we're doing when we're there. Um, I got to I got to tell you about the best story of opening day. And it, it it starts on a high note and ends on a high note. The last quail that Dave shot. We saw it go down and it went down soft. The head was up. We you know, it was it was landing. It wasn't falling. But we marked it pretty well, and I sent Flick over to get it. And Flick swings back and back and hits a point. I'm thinking, yeah, he does that, especially when he's really fired up. He'll point a dead bird. I'm I'm not going to gripe about that. So he does, and we walk in on it, and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a different bird. Because there's no act. The dog's frozen. There's no bird freaking out. Dave walks in on it. It kind of flutters a little bit and then rolls down the hill towards the creek into a big rose bush. And, and even Flick cannot penetrate it. In fact, I'm, I'm still finding scratches on the poor guy. <laughs> but uh, he cannot get in where that bird is. So I call him off, and we're going to just uh, reconnoiter and do it again. Um, and then I look at this rock pile next next to it. And that, the, the rocks in this pile are the size of that dog crate i'm pointing to right now it's they're pretty darn big and the dogs are real interested in that we had dave's 12 year old labrador with us he was the technical advisor on most of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> so so i let him work that for a while pretty soon yeah sure enough the bird's got to be in there because both dogs are real interested but they cannot get in is a flat rock and two big kind of sideways rocks and there's room to get your nose in or, as we figured out later, for me to reach all, my whole arm in. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is in rattlesnake country. <laughs> Dave points that out after the fact. I can't find anything. I'm shoulder deep under this boulder, and I can't find anything. There's a big open space. It's a you know a three by three space, and I can't find anything. So I give up on that after Dave reminds me of the rattlesnake situation. It, but Flick will not be denied. So he comes around from the other side, starts digging. He digs, and he digs. Pretty soon he's in shoulder deep. Pretty soon he's in up to his, his waist. And then you hear that classic. <coughs> There's something in his mouth. And he, he backs right out, looks at us, shows us the bird, and then takes a victory lap. He <laughs> didn't swallow it. He didn't eat it. He didn't bury it. But he did think he deserved a victory lap on that one. And he, <laughs> he was absolutely right. Uh, it got better, though, after that. Because I said, man, you can't top that. I'm, I'm going back to the truck. 
and to that pool that we crossed with the truck yep. where our flick could soak for a while. Dave says, no, I'm, I'm going to go right over there. I, I need another bird because you shot more than me today. Um, that seldom happens. So I walk over to the, um, to the creek, and here's four people, the four people from the two vehicles, and they're soaking their feet, and their dogs are cooling off, and there's a cooler nearby, and so I say hello, and I ask if we can share the pool with them. Of course you can. And here, have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so we spend a lot of time. By the way, thank you, everybody. I know one of you is a listener to this podcast. Thank you very much. Um, we had a great time, and that's how it, that's how it happens sometimes out there. You know that, especially in the middle of nowhere like that. Well, yeah, you. we were back in camp by noon, and you guys, we didn't even see you the rest of the day. No. And I was <laughs> telling my son, Christian, I'm, it's the heat of the day. I know they're not hunting their dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Scott found somebody to talk to and have a <laughs> beer with. <laughs> and it was true, and I love it. Yes. You know, I'll tell you. Um, I've killed enough birds, so have you. Yeah. Uh, three quarters of why we go is is not killing birds and there was a perfect example and it just carried on that whole evening yes. you guys went back out we did and where about where were you then well saturday we went up to chucker mountain yeah so we were you were there though well, well till the dark yeah, yeah till yeah right dark i my, yeah. i'm usually at the truck waiting for my son yeah well you you all don't know christian yet but you will get to know him eventually he could be a navy seal this guy is buff <laughs> and, and he makes us all feel old and, and out of shape. Because we are. But, you know, older and outer, outer of shape. Yes. But, um, but he can put the miles down. Well, rounds the shape. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and did it really cool? Well, that, that canyon gets a lot of shade a lot sooner, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, that's what, one reason we hunted there, because yeah. we were on a east-facing slope. So yeah. it was shady mm -hmm. in the afternoon. So that dropped the temperature down 10 degrees so it made it a little more tolerable and you know that creek we're talking about yep did it mm -hmm. have water in it oh yeah yeah but that's always yeah. running up there yep. so there must be a real big spring somewhere there are a way, lot way there. of springs on that mountain i followed that creek a long way and i've never found the end of it uh, someday that ought to be a hunt yeah you know? well some of those creeks go all the way into those ranches they yeah. actually flow yeah. all year yeah so well that was a f fun evening uh again lit a fire people from all around this is a town it's a town population nine it's got a general store that doubles as a cafe there's a two-room motel and gas station used to be the post office now they've gone beyond that um i've been going there 30 years third generation of different owners there still good people but it it's kind of like a magnet it's kind of strange. You go to the middle of nowhere, and you'll run into people that you know. Happens all the time. Yeah. Last closing weekend, I was there, and I uh, was pulling the trailer together to get, get out of there. And up the road comes two other trailers. One of them is Neil, <laughs> who was in the park for one, two nights that, that on opening weekend. Yes. So it is. It is funny, and and I've met people there who, uh, who were on the TV show ten, fifteen years ago. I've uh, met people who cooked for us yeah. in one lodge or another over the years. It's it's a small dang world. Yeah, we had a. There was a couple there that I did work yeah. for in the town I was from. Yeah, that's so right. We're, gent, we're contractors and work yeah. together. So small Amazing. world. Uh, that you know it, when when I ask listeners why they go hunting camaraderie and friends and family is yep. right up at the top so it, yep. it's not surprising yep well, well crack another one or finish that one i'm going to give you a, a brief moment to rehydrate while i talk about sage and breaker.com i'm raving about it because i love it it's clp it's a little spray instead of all those other kind of cleaning lubrication and protection products that you might have this one is non-toxic and it's got the magic pixie dust in it that makes you your gun able to repel some of the dust it's kind of an anti-magnetic coating if you want to call it that so you're cleaning you're lubricating and then a lot of the dust at the places where we hunt 
and so does everybody else that drive volcanic dust in in the country we hunt chuckers and valley quail a lot of it does not stick to the gun and that's critical in some of those moving part areas so i love sage and breakers clp learn more about all their products for gun care and gun storage at sage and breaker.com So, your dog Ruby, she she was ready to go again in a day or two. Yeah, we went out uh, yesterday. Yeah. So she like in twenty. Typically, it's you know we didn't hunt as long as we typically did because yeah. of the heat. Yeah. So maybe that had something to do with it. But uh, within twenty four hours, she was kind of back to back to where she'd been before. Yeah. So we went out, took the wife one, and we have a little hunt about. It's a less than two hour drive here from the house. It's my shortest drive to Chuckers, and the wife usually likes to go, so it's kind of a date. Yeah, hunt. So it kind of fun. She goes out and hikes while we go. I love it. Look for birds, and uh, it's a beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful Chucker areas in Oregon. Yeah, it is. And uh, I won't divulge, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So we just did a little half day jaunt yesterday and uh, got into a covey of birds. Yeah. So. Ruby did her part, beautiful point, got it on my uh, GoPro, and I got my three misses yeah, perfect, on the GoPro perfect. too, yeah, so that yeah. scene will be deleted. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut in a dead bird if you yeah, like. Yeah, maybe I can, That's what we I do. can splice yeah. something on another hunt to make it look like something. It's kind of probably pretty obvious that uh, the birds kept flying and you don't see anything fall yeah, while yeah. the shots are going off. Can't, can't fix that in post-production. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. You know, I'm glad to hear she's all right. We had, uh, <clears throat> you know, the whole summer was so dang hot. We never got near as conditioned as we should have. We, my dog, me both, actually. Um, and so we went into the opening weekend a little bit out of shape. Yep. Um, and then um, he, on some somewhere on the last part of the last afternoon, somehow took a big chunk out of his right rear pinky toe so one of the few places i don't do all uh, i must have missed it when i was doing all that foot care that i rave about so flicky is still recovering from that right now he's got a little bandage on with his little sock so he split it to the quick uh, no luckily the nail's still good it, ironically it's the nail that fell out a couple of years ago but it's just a big peel off on the on the toe on the tip of his toe so he's got a big ugly scab developing on so it's his on toe. his pad actually. yeah okay. it's on his oh, pad okay. so uh we're managing that because we have a lot to a lot of miles to cover in the next few weeks and we want him to be healthy for that and you know you, you, here's one example and i'm just lucky at this i'm knocking wood um he's learned how to be doctored yep you know and that's that quite often you need to train that stuff you walk up to a dog with a Q-tip or a pair of scissors or a roll of uh, vet wrap, they immediately are leery of what you're going to do to them. And then when you touch something that's sore, oh, man. Yep. You better have a lot of chicken skin on a plate. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's no other way to get a dog to cooperate. Um, yep. you, you've been pretty lucky with her. Yeah, she uh, came through this opening in same same problem. She's overweight. A little bit and out of shape because it's too hot to work your dogs yeah here in the summer um yep. and they were walking like they were on pin cushions by yep. sunday yeah. afternoon i mean they yeah. were sore and we still ran them we ran ours again on monday morning yep oh good <laughs> but as soon as they get a snoot full of birds yeah. it's like there's no pain yeah so absolutely it's, it's just amazing how those dogs just uh come alive as soon as they Matter of fact, so one of Ruby's things on the first hunt, I, as soon as I pull the collar out, which you think most dogs would think, oh, I just want to put that e-collar on. Yeah. She knows what's happening. And yeah. it's just like she's a two-month-old puppy again. Mm. And Monday morning, I pull out the collar. Yeah. And she's bouncing around. I mean, getting out of the truck, she's like, I can barely walk on my feet. And as soon as I pull that collar out, it's like pain's gone. Yeah. We're going hunting. Go figure. And she's... That's just amazing. That's what they live for. 
you went up to that pass that I haven't been up to. I've been going to that area for 30 years. And I know people who run cows up there. I know there's, I know a little bit of that terrain, but you guys went all the way to the top. Yeah. Um, and found birds. Yeah, my son did. I sat in the truck and okay. did something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually brought my deer rifle up there to oh, that's uh, right. run yeah. a few shots to yeah. it because I'm heading to Montana in November for yeah. a deer hunt. So I wanted to check my zero. So I was multitasking. But he found birds. He he found birds. I We had our walkie-talkies, and uh, I was driving down the road to go pick him up somewhere. And next thing I know, I hear boom, boom, and he shot a double. So he did find birds there. Yeah. And then we went back that that Monday morning to the same general area. Yeah. We found a spring there. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I ended up somehow hitting one bird. Excellent. On that, that little foray there, but... Uh, did yeah. that did that spring was it kind of in a swale with almost a pond to it? Yeah, it actually has yeah. a uh, trough there. Yeah, with a pipe into yeah. it. It's yeah. actually amazing amount of water. Yeah, and you it's on it's on the map app. Yeah, so you could find it, but it's in the middle of nowhere. There's just tracks coming into it, but yeah. it's a big area. So that that may be the, the as far up as I ever got on that drive, and. <clears throat> I remember shooting at a snipe up there once. Yeah, it it probably was there. There's another spring not too far from there. It has a lot of grass, so yeah. it could be one of the two. Yeah, it was fascinating. I'll have to get back up there. Also found on that same route, um, there's a cinder cone up there that has um, at its top hundreds of quartz marbles about inch or two in diameter. So if you're looking for treasures, these are the places you go. I mean, we all go there for that kind of stuff. Uh, arrowheads. You ever found an arrowhead out in that country? I have. Yeah. I have. Um, this is probably one of the more remote areas of Oregon you yeah. can go to. It is the darkest place in the lower 48 states. Yes, that's right. I found that out from Dave. Yep. Yeah. We, yeah, that's right. Dave yeah. brought Dave brought his telescope, by the way. Everybody. Yeah, we got to see uh, Saturn. Saturn and Juniper brings the Saturn. The moons of Juniper. Yeah. Juniper. Yeah. Jun- <laughs> Juniper. We're, right. we're from the high desert, yes. everybody. Um, the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter. Sorry. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then the moon moon, like you've never seen it. Yeah, we didn't need any flashlights. Jeez, it was incredible. Um, we went. Um, the second day up that creek I was talking about. And it was the most interesting hunt I've had in a long time. Dave had his doubts. He said, oh, the last time I was here, there was no birds. And, and it's a it's a, a great hunt because you, you walk upstream for quail. You get to the highest spot and you start side hilling and you get up into chucker country. So that was the original plan. And then it got really hot. But we did go up, and Dave said, no, we're not going to find anything. Hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here, Tom Jenkins there. We're debriefing on our opening weekend, by the way. Um, So he said, I didn't find any birds. I said, if I had to, if someone said, I'll give you $100 to find a quail, this is one of the three places I'd bring you. So trust me. So he did. And within 50 yards of the truck... We got into the first quail, and it was a big bunch, and it scattered in all directions. So we we hunted singles off of that for quite a while. But the interesting part was these birds have either been trained or it's genetic or somehow they know that um, fly low at 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 the, as low as you can above the riparian area where all the cover is. And... So we sh- we would shoot a bird, would drop into that tangle, alders, willows, and a little bit of cottonwood. And it'd take 10 minutes for a dog to find the bird. So yep. pretty soon we just looked at each other and said, D- don't only shoot birds that are going away from the water. Yep. Well, that doesn't work. You know that. How are you going to resist? I know it. But we had a good time doing that, and Flick was in fine form. So on the way back... We got a sign. We're walking back. We said, to heck with this. 
there on the road is one chucker feather. Just one. About then, Dave leans over and picks it up, and they call to us from the top of that hill. So it's time to rest the dogs for a while. We go down, we have a bite to eat, and then he says, okay, let's do it. And that's when we started going up that, that far side there. And that side there, we've had all sorts of adventures on over the years. We've jumped mountain lions up there. We've been stalked by coyotes. Uh, in the wintertime, there's a, a cliff that looks like an ice waterfall. You get the runoff at the right time, and you get the cold at the right time. It's right out of a Mount Everest expedition. There's some incredible stuff out there. And you know a lot of that country. Yep. You've been up in there, too. Yep. When you go, um, you found birds in the, the most the unlikeliest spot, that big bear ridge on the, on the south side. Yes. Why do you think they're there? It's just a long ways up there. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially later in the season. Yeah. Uh, it's when the water's not a factor anymore, yeah. once the green up starts. Yeah. Then it's as far away from a road or as high as you can go or the most rugged is where you're going to find the birds. Uh, let's, let's, let's recap some of the lessons we learned, not just last weekend, but over the years on wild chuckers. Because everybody seems to be intrigued by them. And I don't blame them. So am I. And so are you. Yep. But we have learned a few things. Uh, one of the... It's a cliche, but it's true 80% of the time. And that is, uh, if there's no cheatgrass, don't go hunting. I think that's pretty much an axiom. Yeah. Grass cover, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they'll hang in that. Uh, the other one is rimrock. Yep. They like rim rock. Um, some people say it's because it holds the heat, and so at night they're getting a little warmer because they're there. But, you know, we find roosts nowhere near rim rock. Yep. I found them down in just in little swales in the yeah. bottom in grass. So yeah. I, I, you know, I think it has someone to do where they just end up at that time of day. There you go. And yeah. they, I don't know what the signal is. I'd like to know who says, okay, bedtime. Yep. Let's all huddle. Yeah. And that's how I've seen it. And then um, the speaking of that sort of thing, it's not the same someone, but there's always a hall monitor sitting on a rock. Yeah. And he's the lookout for everybody else. I think that's the reason that they, they're they around the rocks a lot. There Two reasons. Go. Yeah. One, they have a sentry. They get above the grass. Yeah. That's typical when they're not feeding. And two, it's typically on the edge of a ridge, and all they have to do is launch yeah. off and down – and around the canyon yep to, they don't have to fly up to get away they just can jump off the the edge and they're gone <clears throat> yeah you know you never think about that but they are always towards a, a cliff-like formation yep. if you want to call or it or they're that. on the break yeah, of the ridge yeah, where yeah. all they have to do is jump up and yeah. fly down and circle around yep yeah and they do they run up and then they fly down and so one of one of the hunting strategies if if your legs are up for it is to skirt all the way around the good looking stuff get as high as you can and then come down on those birds yeah i don't have a lot of luck doing that yeah the, well how much flatland chucker hunting do you yeah. see although i've been grateful i've I've killed birds on flat ground a bunch but getting to the flat ground is yeah. the tough part yeah usually it's 1200 feet up yeah and and then you find a bench or you find a saddle or you find yep. a, a little bowl out yep. there. I'm thinking of another place. Well, the place where we were supposed to go last weekend where you pull a thousand feet. Then you walk from bowl to bowl yep. to bowl. And that's where the birds are. And it's pretty much you hike up till you hit birds and you stay at that elevation. That's kind of a, a key with chucker hunting because they se seem yeah. to be in that band. Saw that yep. time and time again last weekend, as well as many other times when we've been out. Um, they don't ask me why. I don't know what it is. But we also caught them. I was w walking up that magic creek again. And uh, <clears throat> in years past, uh, one old timer across the gas pump from me said, go to that spot at one o'clock. They'll be marching down to the water. And son of a gun, if they weren't. Yep. But not only were they marching down, it was single file, and they were to the little drop-off. And it was a, you know, a cliff about a foot and a half tall. They'd all wait their turn, 
hop down that and go the rest of the way. Wait their turn, hop down that and go the rest of the way. So, um, you know, if, if, even if you don't find them at water, if you're somewhere between where you think they live and where the water is, um, you can find birds, you know, half the time. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Sunday we, uh, so we purposely went to places we knew are out of the way and not where the, the main crowd goes because that was to the north <clears throat> of where we were camped. So we went east a spot that you and I went to last year, and we got into quail and birds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sunday yeah. morning. So we went there. Um, long story short, someone had been there Yeah. on opening morning, and the only reason I know that is, one, we hit no birds, mm-hmm. and the birds I did hear were on the other side of the canyon. Yeah. And Ruby found a cripple, so she got her own, own birds. So somebody had, and it was a fresh, you know, yeah wing break yeah so i knew someone had been there a day before so we blanked out again on a morning hunt there we went to a another area that was heading back down a creek towards camp and we did a hunt there and same thing didn't hit and i decided to walk back to the truck and drive down the road down the creek to go get get my son so he didn't have to walk up and he could keep hunting that's what dads do yeah so i'm told and I won't confess I was road hunting for chuckers, but uh, on the way down the road, a whole covey would gone down into the creek to get a drink at a, some little seep or something that was down there because the creek looked dry. And so I busted them with the truck. So we're here to hunt chuckers. So I jump out and throw some shells in my pocket and grab the gun and start running up the hill because the clock's ticking once they start yeah running yeah. and i didn't even have my collar on ruby and sure enough she gets on their trail and starts going uphill and i can't you know they're running uphill she's running uphill they got there's no way i'm going to keep up and finally birds start busting out and one happened to sail by me like a you know an f-16 just coming downhill two shots and i blew some feathers and dropped a leg and watched it and it sailed about 500 feet down the wow. creek and then i saw where it landed so i marked that bird and uh i had the road blocked and two two rigs of hunters are coming up so <laughs> so i'm i'm heading back down to my truck and i look with my left and ruby's just locked up on point mm. so i walk over there didn't have any camera on just that was our best point of the weekend and i dropped the double right there right in front of the i mean it was just like hey watch us <laughs> and uh, she fetched both those birds and nice. so we got back to the truck went down sent her right in where i saw that bird that first cripple and she found it dead nice right there so we had three birds in 20 minutes it, it, and we were done right so that's hell, how fast it can change that's a heck of a way to end the day yeah, it was a great way to end the morning i got uh we came down and we, we went back down that same creek and uh uh after the chucker hunt way up there we were coming back down into the water so the dogs could hit, get a little relief and uh my collar control says flicks on point 29 yards away and in that country you can't you can't see 29 inches yeah um so it says he's, he's right there and i'm pointing you know it's, I'm, I'm sitting there holding it like a compass okay right there well i can't see him i can't hear him he's still <clears throat> so i i spent five minutes looking for a way to cross the creek finally find one go up on the other side which is relatively bare and there he is locked up still like seven or eight minutes later yep that's awesome still on point right on the incline there <clears throat> and it's one of those tangles that i'm not going in i'm not i just not doing it um so I lob a rock in, nothing happens. So I back up to look for a new rock, and I slip, and I create a little miniature landslide. <laughs> that gets the bird up. But Flick had been holding that bird for like nine minutes by then. That bird gets up as soon as he clears the tree. I pop it. It falls straight back down. The dog and me both see where it drops. I still can't find it, but he goes right in. 
snuffles around for four or five minutes, comes back. And, you know, he's a very humble dog. <laughs> he comes back and his tail's low and he's kind of doing this, you know, and it, it's clear that he, he loves what he does, but he's not cocky about it. Yes. <laughs> They're that's something great. else, aren't they? They are. That's, you know, and that's the whole game. Yeah. Watching that dog. You know, the first quail of the season, it was a little hard to get it out of her mouth. <laughs> I will admit that. She did not want to give up that that quail because mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. had been all year long. Yeah. And uh, it, it, let's just say it was a little bit uh, skinned up. Yeah. By the time I got it out of there. You know, and I and we had a couple of those as well. Like I said, Flick will do a victory lap. Victory lap. And and I don't mind that at all, not one bit. Um, but he gets a little aggressive. If if birds are alive, and Germans are, are like this to a degree, they don't want that thing, you know, bugging them. Once it's in your mouth, it's supposed to hold still. So if it won't, soon it will. Yes, we're, <laughs> well, you're going to tenderize it until it quits moving. Yeah. So I have to monitor the victory laps once in a while. Yeah, we have a little bit of reluctance there at the last yeah. three or four feet. It's like, you know, can I just hold on this a while longer? Yeah. And yeah. I typically have to tap, uh-huh. call, not just the, the tone. Yeah. If yeah. I tap the tone, she knows Yep. I'm not supposed to go yeah. away from you. But I try not to. I try to do it with verbals. Yeah. Yep. But every now and then I just have to tap the tone like it. That yeah, means absolutely. come. Yeah. Not keep away. Yep. So, but, you know, you don't want to take it away from them. You know, it was a, it was our, you know, the shakedown cruise for the season. It was. Opening weekend. Um, I was hunting with a new vest, a hunt ready vest. Thank you, Jared and Heath for that. And by the way, hey, if you're entered at furfeathersfriends.com you might just win your own hunt ready vest uh, but so I had to reconfigure everything and I'm sure I forgot something but I think I got everything in the right place what piece of gear did you find the most useful on opening weekend so I think the biggest thing for me was our shooting lessons at uh-huh. at uh, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School yeah I'll lead into a, yeah. a promotion um move yep. mount shoot yep so i tried my best to keep that mantra in my head yeah yeah and i i have to say not counting yesterday i was probably at 80 90 percent wow on my shooting this opening weekend and i don't i'm gonna contribute it yeah to my lesson that i had this year thank so. you vandy thank you everybody over yes. there chris dave uh, I'm the same way. I felt the same way. I was shooting. In fact, I was shooting so well. Dave said, can you get me one of those guns? I said, it's not the gun. <laughs> no, not the, no, because you're shooting a BB gun, right? <laughs> yeah. But he wants, if you, hell, I already gave him one gun, the one he was shooting that day. <laughs> but but um, no, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Yeah. You I, know, her lesson really squared me away. Yeah, I here again, I can't say I was doing what I was told, yeah. but there were definitely results. Yeah. So maybe that's why. There's no doubt about it. It was, um, it's the unconscious or the subconscious stuff that she has you do. And you know, I, I've talked about this before and I'm going to say it one more time because it's so true. Um, what a great instructor. And here's what I liked most about that lesson was we all have nine problems to solve. She focused on the most important one problem. Yep. And that really, it, it changed the tenor of the hunt. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that one problem was me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's a big problem. But, uh, but if you just get in your head right, all of a sudden everything else works. Yes. So for me, <clears throat> the thing that, um, that I used the most, of course, was my um, GPS collar. And it's funny because you're out there on the high desert. It's sagebrush with a few junipers, but but all of our hunting was near water. And three quarters of the time, you would never know where your dog was unless you had a collar control that you could look at. Yep. Um, I also, I never needed them, but I will always carry them because in that country, there's um, there's some trapping going on. Yep. So I'm now bringing a... Um, an aircraft cable cutter 
for snare traps. <clears throat> Hope I never have to use it, but I'd rather have it and not have to use it than, than the other way around. Um, other gear, you know what? Uh, the other thing I I didn't bring it, and I wish I had. You know those um, bandanas that you soak in water and they plump up yep. and they're mm-hmm. cool the whole time. Yep, they have the uh, little baby diaper yeah, pellets. Yeah, whatever in them. Yep. they are. Yeah. Yep. Um, I found all of them the day after I got home. <laughs> Yeah, I could have used, I have a couple of those, and yeah. they didn't make it on the trip either. No, who would have thunk it was going to be that hot? I know. It was, and it's not looking good here for the next week here. We've got a high pressure sitting yeah. here, so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably going to be more of a later season, lots of chucker hunting until we get some rain and some coolness yeah. here. No doubt about it, but at least we'll know where the birds are concentrated. Oh, yeah. They'll still be there. Yeah. What was the highlight of your trip? You know, it was uh, just the camp, Yeah, honestly. Yeah. I mean, we're both, we've had enough seasons under our belts. It's really about who you're hunting with. You know, I got to meet the, the legend, <laughs> Dave, you know, that I've heard yeah, so much yeah, about yeah, over the years. Yeah. So that was good to sit around a fire with him and yeah. hear some of the old uh, Codger stories <laughs> from the good old days. Yeah, we did go off on a few tangents, yes, didn't we? we Especially we when to, we had an audience. Yeah, so we got to hear some yeah. of the, the stories that have been probably re- repeated for 40 years. Um, yeah, and, but, and for the next 40 as well, I hope. Yeah, well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most of you know Dave. He was, uh, he's was he been a guest on the podcast once. Dave and I went to music school together, and we've been hunting and fishing at least once a year since. And it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, so we do have a lot of stories, but uh, you should be grateful, you and your son, Christian, and all the other people hanging around the campfire. At least we didn't bring any musical instruments to play. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed. I thought we were going to get serenaded. but uh, You're lucky you didn't. I know we didn't. I, I, I can't agree with you more. I think, uh, you know, I, I love walking around out there and I love following the dog. That's why we really do it. But. Uh, at the end of the day, and especially at the end of a day that is short on hunting because it's so dang hot, um, it's either sit around and drink or go socialize. Yeah. And we did some scouting. You guys yeah. did too. Yeah. You know, we're, we're looking at places that when it cools off, we'll be able to spend more time out there. Yep. Um, the lesson also is, you know, on a day like that, you cannot carry enough water. You can't do a four-hour hunt. There's not enough water no. in the world that you're willing to carry. No, we did uh, four liters of water in three hours. Yeah, yeah. And the dog drank 90% of it. Because of that, you're always going to do short hunts. Yeah. Which means you can't go deep, you can't go high, but you just got to plan around all that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm a big game hunter. and My day pack for an all-day hunt is 35 pounds just for a day. And yeah. My chucker pack is all of that between water and lead. It is. You carry a lot more ammo than me. Um, you get well, you're, more birds. You shoot that BB gun, so <laughs> yeah. you just need a handful of them. Yeah, the same number of rounds, half half the weight. Yeah, 28 gauge to a 12 <laughs> to a real gun. Half half the pellets, too. Yeah, half the pellets, like I said. <laughs> but I'll tell you, it was sweet shooting this time. And I will, thanks again, Vandy, by the way. So um, uh, all all good. We had a great time. We'll be back. We'll be back to that other spot a little further south later. Um, there's, you, you know, if you're listening, you, you're hopefully reliving whatever you did on opening weekend. And there are so many other aspects of all of this that are that are incredible. The stars that we saw, we were there on a full moon, basically. Yeah. But we still saw stars. We saw those great, uh, you know, astronomical phenomena that Dave was able to rattle off like that. Um, the social aspects of it, uh, we all saw some new country that we we're going to get back to. It's that's why we go. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's commuting outside of the city. Yeah, you know, just yeah. getting back to nature, even though we were in an RV park, <laughs> <laughs> such as it is. All four units of it. Yeah, but we is, did have all the comforts of home. It's most civilized camping that I typically do. Yeah, in a in a chucker season, but. Uh, yeah, I kind of had to talk my son into it because he's kind of like, "What? We're camping in an RV park?" Yep, yep. I'm like, yeah, just believe me, you'll you'll have a good time. Yeah, he did. I mean, I hope he did. He did. We'll find he, out. He did. Yeah, yeah good. 
Well, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I've got a little bit more to cover lately, but before we do, I'm going to thank Tom for coming on out here. It was a lot of fun. We never get to do this kind of a debrief. We cover some bits of it here and there, but sitting down at length and and just celebrating every aspect of it. Thanks for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Yes, thank you, and thanks for the beer. <laughs> A lot more to come here at the uh, Upland Nation podcast, so thanks for sticking with us. Sorry if we went down a couple rabbit holes. That's what you do when you're talking with good friends about fun hunting, and especially opening weekend. Can't get that off our chest, not for a while at least. But anyhow, thank you so much. Next on the agenda, first off, um, let me tell you that... um, We are brought to you in part by Pointer Shotguns, a work of art at a price that's a thing of beauty. If you don't know what I mean by that, go to the website, PointerShotguns.com, and compare those guns, compare their fit and finish to anything on the market. If you're like me, you're impressed. So uh, take a look at the variety of guns they have from the from the high-end target guns to great looking field guns and a few others that are more entry level and like i've said before soon a new side by side Yeah, (laughs) I call it your two cents worth for a reason because I ask you on social media a question and you share your thoughts, your ideas, your hopes and desires, but mainly you share your pictures. And isn't that the coolest part? I asked you to share your first photo of the new bird season and did you come through in the clutch for us? Bruce Wondrak sends one, send one of Hannah in the grasslands. Uh, Just getting warmed up. He said by then we hadn't got any birds yet. I hope you got some later in the day. It's a beautiful shot. Setter, uh, just relaxed. Lots of ticking. Uh, Nice black mask, almost raccoon-like there. Good-looking dog, Hannah. And good-looking owner, I'm sure, as well. Philip Urban, got your short hair running the edge of a... uh, Well, you're on a mode part of a field that is not mowed in most places with some uh, beautiful fall colors in the background i hope that dog found a bird along there that's where i'd be looking for them dean Steinberg, you look like you were where i was for opening weekend and like me thank you thank you that's chucker country you were up high on a kind of a big bowl of an amphitheater with with some cheek grass and a lot of sagebrush looks like your short hair is on point lucky you and like me so many times your gun barrel is in the corner of the picture because you're holding it under your arm aren't you Ryan Schroer, it looks like you got yourself a prairie chicken there, and congratulations, a very rare bird for most of us. At least that's what I can tell from it. I'm a little colorblind. It it might be a sharp tail, but I think it's a chicken. Good luck to you, and and keep up the good work. Um, Cheryl Tip, that looks like two um, brown short hairs on point in the popple woods maybe there's a woodcock in there maybe there's a roughy who knows matthew kolesnik uh that's a pretty cool picture it's two pheasant roosters and you're shooting it from the top of what looks like above a kind of a tree stump so the birds are laying on the tree stump at the top it's a cool angle and good job uh, Mark Whitley's dog is sitting there on the edge of um, uh, maybe it's a sunflower field. Yes, it is. It's a sunflower field, probably waiting for you to say, hunt him up. Travis Dixon, first Kansas greater prairie chicken for the both of us. Yeah, that looks like chicken country, actually. The grass is about knee high. Uh, looks like a Brittany uh, with. The, uh, the bird in front of him, <laughs> I can't go that far, that's for sure. But the dog is smiling. Don't you? You, you can tell, can't you? You really can. Levi Skank, you've got your dogs there in the beautiful fall woods with a roughed grouse in your hand. A very happy dog on both sides. One's a short hair. The other one, it might have a little bit of something else in it too, right, Levi? 
good on you and good on the dogs there. Beautiful spot. Um, Pup's first grouse point, Ryan Durant says. It looks like a, a bit of an old tote road or something like that. Is that a small monster lander you're running with, Ryan? Long tail, um, beautiful dog, a little bit dark. The, the light is uh, going away fast. Po pointing right into the, um, into the woods there. I wonder if you shot anything while you were there. I bet you did. Well, hey, listen, everybody. That's the way to do it. I am so grateful for your pictures, your comments. Um, keep up the good work there. We are brought to you in part by TrueLockJokes.com. You know, they've got resources of all sorts. Uh, the best way for you to improve your shooting, besides taking a lesson from Vandy, is to get yourself some good jokes. Well-engineered, built the right way. That'll do it for you. Even if you don't pattern your own gun, look at their examples of pattern papers. Understand how that works and understand how obvious it is when you got good jokes versus bad jokes. All sorts of discounts, added value opportunities. Go to truelockchokes.com and learn more. Well, thank you, Tom Jenkins, my buddy, in a uh, well, partner in crime, if you will, uh, for coming along and debriefing us on our mutual opening days in the same place, but not together. Uh, thank you to everybody who uh, contributes on our social media discussions. Those who leave ratings and reviews, that's how we grow. People look at the stars and they say, yeah, I'm going to download that one and see what it's like. We're made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Chokes. If you're headed for South Dakota, look us up while you're there, and I will see you on the road between now and then. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. <laughs>